Uh, next up is a remarkable individual uh, named Alberto Vilmer, who I had the privilege of sitting next to at, at dinner last night. Uh, let me tell you about this guy for a minute. He is the chairman and CEO of Venezuela's oldest privately owned company, which is uh, very much a rarity uh, in today's Venezuelan society. And just to give you an idea of how old this company is, it was actually founded the same year that George Washington was re-elected president of the United States. Um, beyond being a prominent businessman in Venezuela, uh, Alberto's really done something remarkable that goes against the trend of any landowner or uh, business person in, uh, in, in that country, which is he has founded, along with his wife, an organization called Project Alcatraz, uh, which you know, takes reformed criminals and works to reintegrate them into society, something for which you know, the notion of, of having to socialize a society to be comfortable with taking criminals back after they've reformed is, is quite the undertaking. Um, Alberto's going to talk to you about his work and some of his experiences, and I know that you all will enjoy it as much as I did last night. Alberto Vilmer. Thanks. It's going to be a tough one after Jeffrey. Uh, um, I should have brought some of the rum and Coke and black-eyed peas. I think it would have been easier. <laughs> anyway, um, to begin, I just want you to picture the following situation. I, I want you to imagine this situation. It's um, 7 o'clock at night. You're in the office in this hacienda, on this property. Um, and uh, it's, as Jared was just saying, an old property. And uh, you're the CEO of this very well-known company. And suddenly the phone rings. Uh, it's the head of security. His name is Jimmy, Jimmy Perez, right? And he says, listen, I'm here with these policemen up on a hill. They're about to kill this guy. I need a red light or a green light. OK, well, uh, let me give you a bit of context before I continue with the story. Um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, press the wrong button. OK, um, a bit of context. Venezuela, as Jared was saying once again, keeping a business in Venezuela is extremely difficult, either because the macroeconomic conditions are impossible because we've got a, an oil-based economy. Um, also, we've got Chavez who's taking over uh, most of the private companies. I think you've read about that. Um, but also, I think one of the main things, one of the main challenges every Venezuelan has is the insecurity levels. We've got the highest homicide rate, one of the highest homicide rates in the world. We've got the highest kidnapping rate in the world. Uh, this is just to compare Iraq with Venezuela. I don't know if you saw a Newsweek's article a week or two weeks ago comparing the homicide rates between Iraq and Venezuela. Now, bringing it a little closer uh, to the states, this is more or less what the homicide rates look like in the states, Ciudad Juarez, right after the, the big drug war uh, where they had many uh, killings. Um, Ciudad Juarez was around 133 in 2009. Caracas, um, these are figures from the Ministry of Interior. Caracas was 232 homicides per um, uh, 100,000 inhabitants. That means that compared to Caracas, Detroit is like a walk in the park. Um, anyway, in that context, uh, what had happened was that these three gang members had uh, actually attacked one of our security guards. They had almost killed him. They took his gun. They were about to finish him off, and then, then they decided, I don't know why they decided not to kill him. But anyway, our position was, if we don't do something, to re if we don't retaliate, this is going to be a terrible message, not only to this gang, but to all the other gangs. They're going to come inside our properties, and this is going to become hell. So uh, if you call the police, the police isn't going to do anything about it. So I told Jimmy, ex-policeman, you know, go after these guys, let, and then we'll see what we, what we do with them when we find them. Well, what he had done, he called me up when he had the first one, and I said, nah, forget it. Just give him over to the, to the police. Well, the police, when they saw him, they, this was a really wanted guy. And so they said, no, we've got to kill him. We've got to bump him off. So they take him up to this hill. Jimmy goes behind them just because he thought it was, uh, you know, th they were playing with psychological power here. Um, but when he realized it was going to happen, he called me up. And of course, they said no said, no way, red light. So anyway, that you know, got even more difficult. He had to negotiate. At the end, he had to bribe the policeman, uh, which is illegal, right? But, uh, but bribe the policeman so they wouldn't kill the guy, which is also illegal. So, um, so he <laughs> they, uh, they hand him over. Uh, I told Jimmy, bring him to me. 
and we have this gentleman's uh, conversation, right, without handcuffs. And at the end, we, uh, we reach an agreement. I gave him two options. The first option was uh, you work with no pay for three months to make up for what you did, or we hand you over to the police. He accepted the, the first option. Uh, he started working. Actually, I told him, come on Monday. Uh, if you don't appear and if you don't abide by these rules, you know what we're going to do. We know how to find you, and we'll hand you over to the police. So anyway, he starts working. A few days later, we, we find the second guy. The second guy happened to be the gang leader. Well, he, he also accepts the first option. He starts working, and after a few days, he has to have a meeting with me. So we have this meeting, and he says, listen, I'm thinking this could actually turn into an opportunity. Uh, do you think we could give this opportunity, or you could give this opportunity to another two or three of my friends? I said, well, uh, tell them to come on Friday. Um, we, we set up a rendezvous. Uh, and actually what happened was it wasn't two or three that appeared, but uh, the whole gang. It was 22 guys, right? And uh, it's a little intimidating, but the, the, uh, you, know, you have to go with the flow. You sort of go forward. You don't, don't look back, especially not right now. And uh, so anyway, there we decided, yeah, let's go ahead. You know, these guys, I, I was thinking of what the professor was saying yesterday. Why not? I mean, these guys are giving us the most valuable asset that they actually have, which is their identity. Later, we would also find out they have the information of the whole criminal network, which is incredibly valuable. Um, so we take them on board. They start working. And after about uh, two months of working, actually, what we do is we, we use psycholo psych psychological treatment. Um, we use uh, rugby, rugby because it's a contact sport. It's a team sport. Um, the other thing we use is, of course, uh, values formation and formal education and a lot of hard work. So anyway, these guys, after two months, they, um, one of them stands up in a meeting and he says, listen, this is fine, but this isn't going to work. Why isn't it going to work? So well, in a month's time, we're out of the program, and we're going to have to go back to killing if we don't want to get killed, you know, killing the cemetery gang, which is the opposing gang. And so well, you know, you're bringing the, the problem, give me a solution. They said, well, the, the only solution with those guys is to kill them all. You know, they're all psychopaths, man. Huh? So anyway, they go through the descriptions of these guys. You know, they rape their mother, this, blah, 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 all the whole, the whole story. And it, it really, it was a real setback. But after a few days that we sort of rebuilt our sort of uh, determination, uh, Jimmy, I, I told Jimmy, you know, Jimmy, let's, let's go up to this place and see if, you know, we're, we're in this, right in the middle of this gang war. Um, and it's a, you know, one of those double or nothing situations. I think we don't really have an option. So finally, we decide to go up and just imagine, this is, it really sounds quite stupid. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to show the, these, this was some of the gang members, but that was what happened when we, when we uh, th this was more or less the faces we had in that first meeting with the 22 uh, gang members, with the first gang. So um, anyway, we, we decide to go up. What I was saying before is try to imagine, uh, you know, you're in the country with the highest kidnapping rate, and you're going to go up to this slum where the police doesn't enter because in the last year they've killed two or three policemen. Um, they've got sniper positions. It's, it's a d dangerous place. So anyway, we, we, it sounds like a very stupid thing to do, but I think we were in one of those situations where we didn't really have an option. So we start driving up to this uh, slum, uh, windy road. As, as you get further and further up the hill, you, you start feeling the heavy looks at you aggressive looks, sort of, and it, they get even more aggressive, the road gets narrower, until finally you get to, we got to a dead end, which is the where the cemetery gang meets. That's where they hang out. And I remember just instance before stopping the car, I told Jimmy, you know what, Jimmy? We gotta move quick. You know, get out of the car. You know, when we get out of the car, let's create momentum, we have to change the game. I, I by the way, had told him, we're going up there in our best uh, suit and tie. Right to sort of create the the change of uh, of game. So anyway, we get out of the car and it's sort of like jumping out and giving orders to these guys that are you know have the guns here, with no shirts, sort of and you know they're sort of beginning to revolve around the car. They say, hey, get me a table, plug this in, uh, you know, hang this screen up, and so on and so forth. We were getting out with video beams and you know computers and stuff. And anyway, we started a presentation. By, by, you know, in, the, in the first three or four minutes, we had about 
<laughs> yeah, I know, I put, the, put them to sleep, but anyway. <laughs> Actually, what, what, uh, what was going on um, while we were doing this, everybody start, started curiously sort of peeking out, what the hell's going on here, right? This guy in suit and tie, these two guys in suit and ties. Anyway, we had about 200 people standing around us. Um, oh, man, sorry about that. They had, we had about two or three guys standing around us, uh, 200 people standing around us. And basically what we did was we uh, talked about the future of the county. And at the end, I, I decided to challenge the cemetery gang. Most of them were standing around us. And uh, seeing if they were courageous en enough to enter Project Alcatraz. As soon as I said that, they started taking out their guns and saying, oh, those sons of bitches, man, they killed my brother, they killed this, uh, whatever. So I said, yeah, okay, so you can continue killing each other. So after this discussion, I said, take me to the gang leader's house. The gang leader had been shot up by the first gang, and he was paralyzed in bed, three shots in the back. Um, and so we go to this house, and I explain to him, listen, uh, we've got this option. It's your decision, man. You take it. It's your gang. Finally, he said, okay, let's do it. So uh, the second gang enters. We start working with them separately until finally, uh, one day after about two months, we decide to put them in one room and make them make peace. Now, what happened there was that the word spread in the rest of the region, and we started getting uh, uh, calls from all the gangs, prisons, so on, wanting to enter the project. Ever since we've been recruiting those gangs, um, and uh, of course, the, sorry, I forgot to flick these. Um, the homicide rates have gone down dramatically in our, in our region. And, uh, and basically, we have learned three very important things. The first thing is always believe in people, no matter what their background is. Second, criminals are incredibly valuable uh, for solving the criminal issue. And the third is, uh, at least what we have found, is that in the, in the future, in these few next years, businesses must get more involved in uh, social transformation. So that's, that's the story of Project Alcatraz. Thank you very much.